Welcome to our program. I'm Zafar Majid. You're on the Art of Living podcast, and today I have a special guest who is a humanitarian filmmaker who specializes in humanitarian documentaries. He is Matthew Robinson, also known as Muhammad Abdul Mateen, and he has a fascinating journey into Islam. And he said he became fascinated into. the religion of islam because of palestine which is the hot topic of the day at the moment so there's plenty to talk about uh, i would like to welcome him assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh wa alaikum assalam thank you for inviting me onto your show the jazakalla it's our honor and pleasure to host you and uh, there's lots for us to talk about there's been lots happening i know you've been very very busy on the protesting circuit as well especially for the uh, oppressed of palestine and uh, you know how, what sort of an impact do you think we or yourself have been able to make by being out protesting raising our voices um well firstly i think that it's very important to say you know there's there are many people who think that protesting does no good that what's the point you're not doing anything but it does it does and the thing is it's there's something called the battle of hearts and minds and this was actually an oscar winning documentary from the 1970s 80s <clears throat> which was about the vietnam war and this is exactly what is going on right now with israel and with palestine so israel israel is losing the battle of hearts and minds and the more without people doubt. that protest without and doubt. the more people that come to the street the more noise that it's made the more that these right wing abhorrent channels like and this is my opinion i know this isn't yours i'm just showing my opinion gb news talk tv all of these awful presenters including piers morgan uh, who is a paper tiger um it's great because all of this talk about hate marches and hate and it it gets people interested anyone with an open mind anyone with an inquisitive mind who wants to find out more or look into it will look into it and they'll see that actually what's going on the more people dig the more people look uh, it's been fascinating see. because you know mainstream media has been completely obliterated in terms of their credibility and the false narratives that they've been pushing for decades especially around palestine has been smashed to pieces now many many people have woken up and maybe this is the wisdom uh, uh, allah's wisdom as to you know how things are unfolding at this moment in time and it's a great great pivotal moment for people to uh, sort of wake up which people like us look we've been asleep as well yes we are interested in what was happening in palestine but if it's not in the news it's also out of our consciousness as well would you agree with that mm. no uh, well to a certain extent maybe it's always on my mind it's on my it is it's there most days i mean it is uh, palestine that brought me to islam in the first place uh, it, um, that sounds like a, a, a fascinating journey please tell us <laughs> well um uh, i i was born uh brought to a christian church of england family church of england sunday school every weekend church of england school my school was founded by the knights templar and queen elizabeth i so we're talking like christian is christian as you can get at the age of 13 i turned my back on organized religion i felt I wanted to talk to God directly and I didn't and and somebody who worked in the church a vicar uh I felt his I don't know I just didn't resonate with him and what he was saying in his message and and I felt that he was if there was an interaction at my mum and dad's house once he came round he just just become the vicar of where I was living and um and he asked me oh how school I said oh it's great some of my mates vicars come and take assembly sometimes he said oh I'd like to do that what does it entail and what i should have said was you know give a give a parable with jackson humor because he's teenagers but what 13 year old me said was be funny and his reaction actually my mum and dad swear swear to this they were there at the time and they're still christian you know um but they they he was like how dare you take my work in vain how dare you take the lord's name in vain and i felt like man if you represent the church i don't want anything to do with it this this is like i don't like this So I turned my back on organized religion at the age of 13 and I looked into Judaism, I looked into Hinduism, I looked at Buddhism, I looked at 
Wiccanism, I looked at Druidism, I looked at like tree hugging. Do you know what I mean? Some of these things but, are some of these I haven't <laughs> even heard of. No, but, but but the one thing I didn't look at was Islam because Muslims are crazy and who doesn't drink? Do you know what I mean? Absolutely insane. Until now, all the way through my all the way through growing up here, um, my parents and they still do, unfortunately, read the Daily Telegraph. Now, the Telegraph does admittedly have I think the best sports pages of any newspaper. Their sports writers are good. So I grew up with this, don't forget. So I was go I'd always go from the back of the paper, flick through, then it'd be business, flick through that, didn't like that. Then I'd get to international news and it'd always be Palestine. Israel Palestine. And the language was always Palestinian separatist extremist fundamentalist terrorist. Israeli settlers, farmers, civilians, victims. And uh and I remember reading about this guy, Yasser Arafat, thinking this guy, he's like, you know, he looks a bit crazy. And um, my mom, I was chatting to my mum, that was it, I was going to, I was working in a pub. I was going to the Christmas party and I had, the, 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 the fancy dress theme was stern, firm leadership. So I thought, who could I go as? I can't go as Hitler. I can't go as Mussolini. I, can't, I don't want to go as Margaret Thatcher. Who could I go as? Uh, Yasser don't Arafat. Oh, you said, don't tell me. You said Yasser Arafat. I did. I, I, went, I decided to go as Yasser Arafat. So I've, I've got a white T-shirt on. I wrote PLO on it. I've got a big tea towel tied it around my head. And my mum was got. Mum was like, what are you doing? I said, I'm going to this Christmas party. She said, are you going as Yasser Arafat? I went, yeah. I said, firm, stern leadership. And she went, you know that he's a really good man. And what happened to, what's happening to the Palestinians is terrible. I went, what? So my mum... Alhamdulillah, still alive. She was a nurse for 50 years. And oh, she questions everything. And she instilled that in me. And I'm eternally grateful to her for that. And um, so her saying like, yes, Arafat was a good man. And what's happening to the Palestinians is unfair. They've been subjugated. You know, they've, been, you know, they've had their land stolen. My mum was saying all this to me. And I'm like, well, it was completely opposite to what I read in the paper. Um, and she's a great judge of character. So... Uh, I was I was like okay um, didn't really think about it again too much until about a year later just just want to interject here don't forget what you were going to say I don't want to interrupt your flow of thoughts but even as a Muslim growing up in this country being the eldest child of immigrant parents when I my sort of frame of reference for this Palestine and Israel uh, issue was through the lens of the BBC growing up and I used to see the Palestinian, I think it was in, during the first Intifada, uh, Intifada uh, as a kid, when they're throwing stones at the soldiers and they are trying to restore peace and order, I was automatically of the impression that these are the good guys because they're in uniform, they are <laughs> trying to restore law and order. These guys look like the delinquents and the... Um, troublemakers so they automatically must be in the wrong and obviously watching it through the lens of the BBC that is exactly how that perception was being built yeah. up. there was nobody there to tell me otherwise because my parents were uneducated and uh, it's only later on when you obviously realize that how what sort of a complete total utter bull that we were fed with. yes Yes, so no, I, I, I'm presuming that I'm a bit older than you, but we're probably what 80s, 70s, 80s kids. Would you 80s say? kids, yes. 80s <laughs> kids. All right. Yeah, I was born in 1973, but so I grew. So what we're talking about, um, like the authority figures and you trust the people in uniform and all that was a real Thatcherite, like 1980s, 70s, 80s, for 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 many people, um, especially well in the demographic that I grew up in, anyway, and and so. A year later, after that, I, I, I went to uh, start my media course at Bath Media College. And one of the, for the dissertation, we were given one of 10 questions to pick. And one of them was the representation of Islam in the British media. Of course, that absolutely leapt off the page of me because of the conversations I had with my mum and everything I read in the papers. So I, I, I bundled myself down to Bath mosque and for your research turn that to do some research yeah i think i have my eyebrow pierced shaved head can't remember if i had a bristol rover shirt on or not 
But I banged on the door and the guy opened it. He, he thought he was going to pass out. He thought, I think he thought I was there to kick off. But um, he invited me in uh, and we talked about it. So he said, what do you know about Islam? I said, not a lot. Um, he said, well, you can't write about a subject unless you know the basics of the subject. I said, yeah, I know all about Palestine, though. I've seen, and my mum said, and he said, no, 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 no. We can't talk about politics. We talk about the faith itself. Because the question is the representation of Islam in the British medium. Okay. And I left there after two hours and I thought, do you know what? And I came, I left there and I came up and it's, it's opposite the police station in Bath down in this little dingy basement on Manver Street. And I looked down in this dingy little basement and I looked up at the glorious Bath Abbey and I thought, do you know what? After 10 years of having no faith, I thought, do you know, what? if I had to pick a religion, it'd be Islam. It's forward thinking, logical, love and set of guidelines to lead your life by. And you know, that's the, the faith I would embrace if I needed it. I don't need it, I'm fine. But anyway, four years later, I then met my now ex-wife. We got married in Pakistan. Um, I took Shahada in the Faisal Mosque in Islamabad. Shah, Shah Faisal Mosque. Huh? The Shah Faisal Mosque in Islamabad. Yeah, the Faisal Mosque, Islamabad. Okay, okay. Mashallah. Yeah. We, so we, was we, your we, wife big, from... Big spikes on the corners. From Britain, or she actually actually met her in Pakistan? No, no, no. She was she was British Pakistani. She, British. she is British Pakistani. Okay, yeah. okay. We had four children, but but we we we've been divorced now what five six years. So. But going back to the topic of your dissertation, that is still a very relevant topic. That in many many decades Completely. later, it's still so prevalent that the misrepresentation of Islam in the British media, especially around this conflict in um, Palestine. I don't like using the word conflict. I just accidentally slips out of my mouth because conflict makes we're, it we're look like there's two equal we're parties. We're conditioned. But, yeah, That's why. yeah, yeah. But tell me but, about, you know, what your research revealed and how is that still relevant and prevalent today? Well, my research revealed the subtle and insidious use of language simple very very simple but just by changing one word for another you can you change the entire feel of an article feel of uh, of representation so um you know like we've seen it recently that uh, uh is x amount of israelis killed and then it was um x amount of died. died you know they died just miraculously yeah do you know what i mean it's like it, it, it's and another example as well. I haven't watched it in its entirety. I started to watch it. It was with Piers Morgan's interview with that doctor, uh, NHS doctor. Yes. Um, and the one it was, whose whole it was, family was twenty-two members of his family were killed. Um, and uh, basically, I don't know if it's the same. The one it was last night. Oh no! Sorry, I don't know watch it. I haven't seen it for a good few days. No. Okay. Well, basically. Um, uh, all over Talk TV, they've put um, NHS doctor is a, a Hamas extremist terrorist really? because he was calling for yeah because he said no I I call for a jihad and what I mean by that is um, and this is quoting the doctor uh, what I mean by that is I call for Muslim nations to rise up and assist the people in Gaza, not anything else. But of course, Piers Morgan. I haven't watched it yet, but I've seen some comments on it, and uh, I've watched the beginning of it, so I need to go back and continue to watch that. But I mean, a couple of things on that. Firstly, I mean, I watched a lot of the earlier interviews on that Piers Morgan program, and he seems like a broken record player, constantly saying the same. Oh, I'm in a moral quandary about this. You know, Israel has a right to defend itself, and. Yeah, we have to discuss proportionality, but you know, I'm in a moral quandary. While you're in this moral quandary, thousands and thousands of children are being slaughtered, or have been slaughtered with hundreds on a daily basis, an hourly basis per minute, whilst you're in a moral quandary. Because, you know, what we don't, you don't seem to be in a moral quandary about what Israel is doing uh, in terms his, of... His, his, yeah. only, his only moral quandary is, uh, and it's not a moral quandary, um, I think he's lying. The only Obviously. quandary that he has is uh, how far either way does he go? Because he has to keep his audience, and by keeping his audience and getting pe more people to tune in means he keeps his show, he keeps his pay packet, he keeps his profile, and he keeps 
raking in the bucks, and that's that's what it boils down to. Yeah, with him, yeah. I don't think. I think there, are, of course, he's human. Everyone, everyone has humanity in them somewhere. But um, yeah, I, I feel that he's he's a paper tiger, and he goes with. I don't know. He just goes with. Um, I suppose you, the, the, you the also right, the right of west of centre position. I suppose you can't, or you you may not want to bite the hand that feeds you, because your paymasters are inclined in that particular way, in the sense that bite that hand off, yeah? bite that hand off. This is what I've been doing, right? I, look, okay, I'm a humanitarian filmmaker, right? And over the years, I've found that ever since COVID, my work has dropped massively. Now, what people do now, they go out, and a lot of people film on their phones. People make reels. Sometimes people will um, take a videographer somewhere, but generally speaking, not anymore. People don't need to. Technology is so advanced now, and phones are so good, you can shoot something really nice on your phone. You can get a soundbite from someone. If you've got someone who half knows what they're doing, you know, um, that's what happens. So I, I found myself going more back into the mainstream, mainstream TV. Now, I did, I was in K uh, Pakistan doing K2 base camp trek with Muslim Charity in August. And then I came back and I, I went straight on to the US version of SAS Who Dares Wins, which is mainstream TV. And then obviously that finished and I went into something else with another production company. Um, and then October the 7th happened. And I've always been pretty vocal. I don't, over the last few years, I've been a bit more careful about what, how I open my mouth in a work environment, in a professional environment. Because I think, you know, I've just come in to do my job. That's it. Keep your head down. Whereas I've always been vocal in the past. But now, all over social media, all over LinkedIn, all over um, Facebook, all over Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, all these places, I'm very, very active, very pro-Palestinian, very critical of Israel, very critical of the Zionist lobby, and very critical of the British government, very critical of Keir Starmer, and at times critical of British police. Do you see how Keir Starmer was humiliated last week on the train in Scotland? Yeah, yeah, exactly. But I'm going, so sticking with your point about not biting the hand that feeds you, I have been so vocal and so critical and I've been put up for a lot of jobs and I am, well, I'm 50 years old. I've been doing this for 25 years. You look at my CV, I am really good at what I do. Alhamdulillah. I'm not getting any work. I'm getting nothing. Jobs, what, simple jobs get put forward for. Is that, is that because they Google you and they see your views and... Evidently, evidently. But you know, risk is written. Risk is written and I have faith that everything's going to be fine, inshallah. And actually, okay. to be honest with you, a lot of my time now, maybe this is God's plan to enable me to do more, <clears throat> more on the protest films because my time is just, I mean, since Saturday morning I went out to film, I haven't stopped working until today. I went to bed, I was editing so late last night, I woke up this morning, Fajr, I've been editing. And, you, and it's non-stop. And you've uh, in recently interviewed a great spokesperson stroke, I mean spokesperson, not the right word, a great friend and sort of somebody who speaks up for Palestinians, Jeremy Corbyn, who I always say is the best Prime Minister we never had. And uh, I mean, he is a classic textbook case of someone who had his career destroyed by the Zionist lobby. Absolutely. You know, I can remember in 2021, we were stood outside the Israeli embassy and I, and I met Jeremy, the first time I met him was 2017. And I had one of those Corbyn t-shirts, you know, like the run DMC, Corbyn. Yeah. And I had to sign it. And, and then I met him a few times after that and I was, we, he was just about to speak and I stood there filming and I, I said to him, I said, you know what? I said, you should have been Prime Minister. And he was like, yeah, I know, I know. And, and it, but it was done in such a humble kind of like res resigned way. And it was, it was like really sad, if, if it, really sad that, that a man of such integrity, such truth and um, action had that taken away from him by the Zionist lobby, by someone as corrupt and um, uh, dishonest and duplicitous as Keir Starmer, who yeah. is funded by the back. Friends of Israel. Funded by the Friends of Israel. You know, this man has a conflict of interest. He should not be leader of the Labour Party, you know. But, um, but yeah, going back to Jeremy Corbyn, he, you know, at the protests, he always does give me a, 
allows me, gives me a bit of time to get a soundbite. I talk to him, always ask him a question about particular things at that time. Like, for example, obviously on Saturday, I talked to him about the uh, US veto and what can we do? You know, how can we take action? Um, so, yeah, so he, 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 I mean, he's a great man. And then, of course, Richard Boyd Barrett, the uh, Irish um, MP, was was uh, was there as well on Saturday. And, and he gave, I interviewed him, and he gave a very interesting interview about the Genocide Convention and how all of our countries have signed this convention and have a legal obligation to enact it, but we're not. And... But, 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 but Matthew, these genocide conventions, human rights conventions, United Nations conventions, they're not worth the paper they're written on. Look at the way Israel is acting with impunity, with absolutely no retribution for their actions. So what's the point of all these conventions and these rules? You might as well just discard them and throw them away. Well, actually, I, I, I understand your sentiment and part of me agrees with you with that because yeah part of me does agree that what is it worth you know you know there's a, there's that famous photograph of um uh is it a, a un soldier with un and said interested uninterested united nations you know what i mean it's like it's like it, 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 how can an organization that that can the majority vote for something and one person vetoes it and then it doesn't happen you know that yeah. you're right it's it's a fallacy however with the UN and the International Criminal Court, they did bring to justice um, Radovan Karavich, um, uh, Milosevic, all these people from the Balkan Wars. They, it took 20, 30 years, but they were brought to justice. So at the same time of the fact that that has happened, I'm sure there are elements of the Israeli government who must be thinking, shit, I want to, we're going to do this, we're going to do this, but in the back of their mind. So I do think it's a useful force to have if it's implemented now there isn't so much evidence of war crimes there's so much information now that could put them all away for put them all away for life there's information out there which i would like to talk about later which should make rishi sunak lose his position as prime minister you know it's there but we just need to find a way to enact this to, to bring this about there's, there's something you mentioned recently about Gaza burns and Rishi earns some sort of uh, information about the genocidal conflict and uh, how uh, there's a conflict of interest for him and his family as to why he's not interested in a ceasefire. Yeah, okay, well this, uh, the background to this, we, myself and Faz Ali, who he's, ha he's come on board Migration Forms, he's a journalist, um, we were sent this document um, by anonymously. Well, I know who the person is, but I'm not telling you. <laughs> but they were, we were sent. We this don't need to know. Part by a research. You don't need to know. But um, and it was all of information in the public domain. Now, what what brought this about was um, I saw uh, Barnaby Rain, the, the the Jewish academic, British Jewish academic, arguing with. The Haunted Pencil. Now, The Haunted Pencil is Jacob Rees-Mogg. I think that's a great description for him. You know, he does look like a haunted pencil. So this is on GB News. Now, I watched this interview online, because Barnaby shared it, and it was shared across a number of platforms. And so I know someone who works at GB News, who used to work at Islam Channel. They left and went to GB News. And um, and so I messaged her and said, I'll get me on, I want to have a go at these presenters. Jokingly, kind of half-jokingly, and she calls me two days later going, Matt, your wish is coming true. You're live on air in 15 minutes to talk about marching on uh, Remembrance Sunday. So anyway, there's me. I'm like nervous as hell. And I go on live and I talk to them. She said, you'll have about three minutes, eight minutes. I've got eight minutes. And it, even though I say so myself, I, I did slay them. And I, 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 they asked me questions and I did the old ABC. Acknowledge, bridge, continue carried on talking about what I wanted to talk about. And one of those things was um, the fact that they're not calling for a ceasefire is um, because it's a conflict of interest of Rishi Sunak. And I said, Rishi Sunak's... And I, okay, I didn't, put, I didn't present it very well. I said, Rishi Sunak's wife's father. It does sound dodgy, doesn't it? It's like your uncle, uncle's aunt, his mother's brother's cousin kind of thing. I said, Rishi Sunak's wife's father's created a company called Infosys. 
So this presenter's like, oh, what, are you telling me? And he goes off and ridicules him. I'm like, yeah, listen, this is the case. So off the back of this, somebody saw this, and they sent me this report. And this report is, uh, it's not, the report isn't in the public domain, but all the information on it is. So they've compiled this report. It's very, very good, very comprehensive. And like a peer-reviewed journal or peer-reviewed paper, it has references, numbers of references. So is this report in wide circulation? No, the report isn't. No, but the information on it is in the public domain. All the information has been collated from the public domain. And later I want to come on to talk about what we can do for Gaza and Palestine as well, mm -hmm. which is related to this. I'll use this as an example. Mm -hmm. But, um, and it turns out that Rishi Sunak's wife, who was obviously not paying tax until last year, we understand, or the year before, was it 2022 took 6.5 million out of emphasis, beginning up till March 2023 took another 6.2 million from emphasis. Her shares are worth 744 million pounds. Now, she has 0.8% shares in emphasis. And the the conflict of interest here is obviously this is Rishi Sunak's wife so so just prior to I think it was last year sometime or, no actually no it was May this year I think March March and May this year Rishi Sunak's father-in-law was name Murthy Mr Murthy um, who is the founder and owner of Infosys mm -hmm. he signed a 1.5 billion dollar contract with bp british petroleum now that was to do end-to-end -to, -end to take care of their technology everything they need from start to finish infosys based in israel an israeli company started by rishi sunak's father-in-law so just to uh, clarify infosys is actually based in israel and not india i just double check that no they're, they're registered in israel it's an oh, israeli is it? company okay yeah, yeah. And, and actually, two years ago, I think it was, um, uh, the head of Unit 8800, which is the Israeli military intelligence unit, became one of the board of directors for Infosys. So this okay. is all tied into Israel. Now, so, so they signed this contract. Infosys signed this contract with BP. And then a couple of months later, Rishi Sunak then provided drilling licenses it was all over the news you know and he's under the premise that uh, it would pre present uh, energy security for this country and uh, uh, greenpeace looked into it and they worked out that actually no it's not going to be better for the environment it's not going to be better for the country so rishi sunak signed these licenses with bp and whilst after october the 8th after israel started attacking gaza a few weeks ago maybe a month ago now um, Israel have now issued 10 drilling licenses for the gas fields and oil fields off the coast of Gaza. To, be t to BP. 700 trillion cubic litres, which is however many billion barrels. BP is one of those companies that have been granted a drilling licence off the coast of Gaza. So this is, this is where... It's a monumental Rishi, conflict of interest monumental a man involved with this should not be allowed to make any decisions with regards to a ceasefire and the lives of innocent men women, women and children so, you know so just and for the benefit of the viewers this these drilling licenses are just off the coast of gaza that's why they want yes these people to be done away with yes exactly israel wants to own israel don't even own that land or that water the territorial water yet mm -hmm. they're now dishing out drilling licenses they have issued i think it's 10 drilling licenses a company called eni or any i think and bp those are the two other companies i'm not sure who the others are but straight away rishi sunak should not be making these decisions he should not be allowed totally, totally. And, and 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 in effect he should be removed from power Look, we've seen what the tories do we've seen with baroness Moni with the ppe we see how corrupt they are you know it's like people think of i mean listen i'm british I'm, uh, uh, and uh, and I've grown up. I grew up thinking that Britain was the best country in the world until I visit the rest of the world. <laughs> you know, th this is one of the this is one of the most tolerant countries in the world and one of the most integrated countries in the world. There's no doubt about that. There's a lot of amazing things about this country. However, 
the corruption is no different to any other country. It's no different. And I'm not going to name countries, it's, but it's no just different to any other country. Yeah. 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 I mean, there's always scales I'll, I'll, of corruption, I'll, 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 isn't there? I mean, I, I say you can have a company, you can have a country, uh, uh, I mean, you can have a country which is swindling funds, aid for, destined for their people. But at a high level, you have countries which go to war with other nations based on false premises, based on a hidden agendas. So who is more corrupt? The one who just swindles the money or the one who, because of his corruption or their corruption, people are slaughtered and genocide is happening or, you know, masses amount of people are massacred. Well, this is something I was saying. I said, well, at least in this country, people aren't being shot at protests yet. At least people aren't being rounded up and arrested. Well, this is actually what's happening. Not shot, but people have been arrested. There was a, I saw something this morning, a, a, a mother from somewhere in Wiltshire, I believe. Yesterday, she was, she'd been posting, just sharing stuff online. Um, the police, five police officers kicked a door in, in front of her three children. She's disabled. They made, they watched her go to the toilet. They made her dress. They took her an hour and a half in a, in a van to Swindon Police Station, where she was charged with terror offences. For what? Eventually, for sharing something online. Then they said to her, you have to denounce Palestine. You have to denounce Hamas, and then we'll we will drop the charges. And she's like, I stand by Palestine. So now she's on bail. So I'm actually looking into this. I've contacted Swindon Police Station this morning. No comment. I've got to email them. Um, interestingly, I did a post. I replied to the post on Instagram and my po my comment was deleted as spam. There's a whole load of censorship going on at the moment. Um, but, um, yeah, it's, it's it, the, the, the like, like, for example, I will give you another example as well. Um, I put a petition i've actually there's i've actually put a few petitions out one is to stop british citizens serving in the idf that's a change.org because the parliament turned it down that's from two years ago still going um and then the other petition that i registered with them was to charge british citizens serving in the idf in gaza with war crimes upon their return to the uk and there's no and, appetite for that without a doubt well basically all i did was i copied and pasted i changed a couple of words but i copied and pasted the 24 2014 petition of the same thing which was accepted but had now closed. So I posted that and they replied to me just now today. And I did this a couple of weeks ago. I, I posted so what, that. what's the difference between British girls, which I've seen, going to serve in the IDF and Shamima Begum, who went to Syria and she none has had a nationality revolt? None, none at all, just racism. White, super, white supremacist colonial mindset racism. So mm. basically, um, they replied to me today and they said, well, this is a people serving in the IDF, blah, blah, blah. Uh, it's a matter for the police, not for us. But what we can do is you can sign this petition, which stops people serving in foreign armies, if you're interested. And I was like, no. I said, I copied and pasted this from the 2014 petition, which was accepted. So you have, a, you know, and I, I said, as an accredited member of the press, here's my press ID number. I will be investigating and doing a piece on this. So I suggest you turn your turn around reassess the situation and grant this petition to stand thank you very much so i'm going to wait to hear back from them and literally that was about an hour ago i sent that wow. so how safe are me and you i mean we post online raise our noises uh on these platforms against what's going on in palestine so what's stopping the police from coming knocking our door well nothing but this is why it's important that we make noise about what's going on about this story in particular one thing I must say is I don't know what she posted. I don't know what content she posted. All she did was she shared things. So, I and the other thing as well with the police sometimes, if this, you know, I don't know if this individual uh, was involved with other protesting that maybe she might be known to the police. I don't know. So I don't know any of these things, which means maybe they were looking for anything to get her on. We don't they, know. They are, they're arresting people based on the most silliest reasons. I mean, there was one, the actual police posted out a social media uh, post. We are trying to identify this person. If you know them, let us know who they it's are. Disgraceful. And what the, what the lady did, she just held a banner with a picture of Nazi Germany parading naked Jewish men and what's going on in Palestine with IDF parading the naked Palestinian men. She just wrote at the bottom, spot the difference, and now the police want to speak to her. 
she's become a person of interest or apparently a crime has been committed I've, I've seen that online and it's absolutely disgraceful putting her face out there that could make her a target for right-wing fascists, for Zionists, for anybody. Completely irresponsible by the Met Police. Completely irresponsible. I mean, I say, um, what, what crime has she committed? There's absolutely nothing wrong with that banner. None whatsoever. And this is a clampdown again by, by th this, this, this sense of... Um, it's, it's, it's... What's the word? selective outrage selective morals selective decency yeah. selective law it seems um going back to this lady what i was saying was i was just assuming that she might have interactions with the police before from protests i don't know she probably hasn't she's probably completely innocent and maybe they're just i don't know they've just gone in and victimized her which which is what it seems like it probably is but i think it's important that this needs to be called out you know as i said i called swindon police station this morning and I was told that I had to send an email to Swindon Police Station to their press department because I obviously declared that I'm a member of the press. I gave them my press card number, um, which I suppose that helps me being a member of the press because an accredited member of the press, which means that I'm trusted. Uh, I've got my actually I've got the card here. I'll read you what it says on the back. And this is why it helps. I'm able to say a few things maybe some people can't. The National Police Chiefs Council recognised the hold of this card as a bona fide news gatherer. Okay, so that means that whenever I've shown this to it protests, the police generally get out of my way and generally behave. Because only one protest at King's Cross, I, I was trying to record, record what the police officer was saying, so I put my phone... I was recording like that with my, my microphone, I put my phone next to his face and he went nuts and got all angry with me and then threatened to remove me. But other than that, it's been pretty, it's been pretty good for me to, to get access in, in these protests. And Matthew, what's your advice to people who want to help sitting here from the UK, help the people in Palestine to stop this, these massacres, genocide from happening? What can they do? There's so much that can be done um the first things you can do before you even leave your house is write letters write emails so write to your you can write to your mp demanding a ceasefire because all this is logged all this is registered online um uh, there's uh there's a link tree called have you heard of link tree no okay link tree is like a sub stack it's like um it's l-i-n-k-t-r dot e-e link tree forward slash how to help gaza and in there there's a whole load of resources there's the um each of the protest partners websites so friends of al-aqsa stop the war palestine solidarity campaign uh, muslim association of britain palestine palestine forum in britain cnd uk all of their websites are there there's websites for um charities who have people on the ground so i know for a fact that Restless Beings, which is a very small charity in East London, but very effective, alhamdulillah. Um, Muslim Charity, uh, those two charities I know personally, and I know they have people in Gaza, and they have offices in Gaza, and have done for, I've, for years. I've heard, I've heard about charities uh, being uh, sort of probed into, because if they're helping uh, Palestine, Palestinians, if they have money that they are sending to Palestinians, they are being targeted by the authorities that maybe they are funding Hamas, you know. The, the, I, I mean, I, I'll, yeah, I'll come, yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'll come back to that um, in a second, but I'm just talk, talking about the, the link tree, what else, the other information on there is um, there's educational resource by uh, uh, a university called Macan. It's an online course. Talks about Palestinian rights and reality, contemporary rights and realities. Talks about the history of what's happened there. Covers the West Bank, Gaza. Covers 1967 war, the Six Day War. Looks at um, citizenship, uh, legal rights of people. You know the uh, center of life uh, policy of Israel, which is to make sure that as a Palestinian living in East Jerusalem, you have to prove that your center of life is there if you leave sometimes they don't let you come back so there's all of these uh, elements um there's also what's very useful is there's a link to cage which is um uh tells you how to deal with a protest and what to do if you're arrested in a protest um and other resources as well um 
and there is also there's the petition for to stop British citizens, citizens serving in the IDF. There's also the letter to the International Criminal Court a template, and you click on this link. Uh, it does. I put it on my website. It, it takes you to a, you copy and paste this letter. You click on this link, and it takes you directly to the International Criminal Court, where you can request that Netanyahu and his cabinet be tried for war crimes. So there's can't all these wait. different. Can't wait for the day. Mm, all these different resources there, um, and that's going to be continually growing as more information comes in and more resources come in. You know, I was hoping to be putting this pro this. Um, petition the new petition on there but now i'm gonna to have to wait and see what this parliamentary committee say um but yeah going back to what you're saying about the charities um you know as a humanitarian filmmaker i different places i've been around the world i get requests from gaza people reach out and they say brother please can you send me some money and i'm like i can't i'm really sorry i can't send you anything i have people from um from Syria, from from Gaza, even from the West Bank, and I can't send any money. And the reason for that is, if I send money, the British government will look upon it as I am funding terrorism. It's that black and white to them. That's how much of a, a stranglehold the Zionist lobby has on the British government, British law, the Houses of Parliament. <laughs> The infrastructure, you know, and someone, some people could say that this is anti-Semitic. Well, it's not. This is all fact. You look at all the people who hold positions of power. You look at, for example, Keir Starmer, who supports him, the Jewish um, um, friends of friends of Israel. You know, they are people that funded Keir Starmer's campaign. You know, um, and. The, the 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 thing is that it's all there in the public domain to see you know th there is no untruths being spoken about this this is all information that is there for the public to look at and obviously this funding comes with conditions absolutely yeah. of course you're not allowed of to course. speak up for the rights of the palestinians you know if you take our money then you sing our songs yeah, I'm praising. This is exactly that, exactly that, and and that's the thing. Things like Piers Morgan, it's great to appear on their on, on his show, say for because you can have a lot of people watching, and and I do believe that everyone who goes on feels they can sway people's hearts and minds, you know. Um, but as I've found out with GB News, I was lucky. I was lucky. I just I just ignored what they said and carried on saying what I wanted to say and got it out there. They called me up two days later and said, we'd like you to come back on the show to talk about it again. And I'm like, no, thanks. This, this, by you mentioning GB News, you've just reminded me that this is a conversation I was having with a friend uh, just a couple of days ago. And I said, look, when we were growing up, there was a British National Party was sort of uh, trying to break into the mainstream. They seem to have disappeared now, but quite rightly so, because the conservative party have taken their place and they're more right wing than what the <laughs> british national party were back 20 years ago wouldn't you agree yeah they are and even the labor party now sorry to say it keir starmer is um he's a tory yeah. i mean this is this is an individual i really dislike keir starmer yeah like I, I i can't rishi sunak is awful but i actually think i dislike keir starmer more than i dislike rishi sunak because he is a, a turncoat he is someone who is a wolf in sheep's clothing he has been honored by the spectator a right wing tory supporting publication he praises margaret thatcher it's like what is this man doing is at the head of the labor party there needs to be we need to get okay i'm going to call out some mps here we need to get naz shah we need to get Claudia Webb, we need to get um, uh, Zara Sultana, we need to get Apsana Begum, we need to get these MPs, we need to get Richard Bergen, we need to get the, the Labour MPs to put a vote of no confidence into Keir Starmer. Get him out. You, you, get you know, him One of the out. things that always crosses my mind is that when the campaign against Jeremy Corbyn was in its peak, he should have stepped back 
and launched his own party with a huge fan base at the time that he had and the infrastructure and the support of momentum. I think he missed an opportunity. I listen, I think on an individualist basis, yeah, but he's a socialist and he thinks of the bigger picture and the people and what's more important is to get these tourists, these corrupt, corrupt tourists out of power. But the Labour Party is no longer the right platform. No, but it's like, it's better to have them than the Tories. And, and, and I suppose at the time, maybe he felt he didn't want to divide the population. He wanted, and he, you know, he, he's a man who thinks of the people, not himself. And I if do. he was self-centered, you know, there's other ex, ex labor politicians uh, whose names I won't mention from north of the border, who I feel, I hate, sorry to say this, but they talk a lot, they talk a good talk, but it's always criticizing other people and and it's self-interest jeremy corbyn has no self-interest he is a man of the people he is you know his peace and justice project this is his project that he set up mm. peace and justice i mean yeah. it's like it, it is what it says on the tin this sums him up perfectly and yeah he is you know and every time at the protest he's he's introduced as the people's prime minister he is the people's prime minister yeah. you know at the end of the day at the end of the day, these people that, that, that are in power, they do make the decisions yeah. to a certain extent. But the decisions they made are driven by money, are driven by lobbyists, are driven by organisations that are in the background. And it's the same whichever country you're in. Absolutely, as, um, absolutely. State, of, state of the world today. Matthew, you're a man who's ex travelled extensively. And obviously, we want to talk about... Um, your travels, perhaps not today, but uh, no doubt, you know, uh, we'll call you again. But you've actually written about these whole sort of travel log that you've done in your whole life. Yes, yes, it's called um, 104 in the Shade, Travels of a Humanitarian Filmmaker. Now, it was, it was originally called Travels of a Humanitarian Filmmaker, but I felt it was a little bit dry. It's a bit kind of like, well bit of a boring title so i thought what tires all of my travels apart from one i think all of them together and that was the heat really very hot really? bangladesh pakistan somalia lebanon iraq you name it myanmar that myanmar was probably the so, so how does a a white male uh suffer which i cope in this extreme heat because asian people with darker skin can cope in the heat but uh, obviously i'm aware white Caucasian uh, people uh, are not fond of extreme heat. Well, I'm fine. Love it. Really? Yeah, absolutely love it. The only thing is, um, it's just at night. I just find, uh, find it difficult to sleep at night when it's really, really hot. So whenever I go on these trips, I quite often get cold because I've got the air con on and then I go out into the heat and then back into the cold and into the heat and into the cold. So I think there's one time... Um, 2020 October 2020 after first lockdown I went out to Bangladesh that was my last trip to Bangladesh and we were near Silet out in these rice fields we had to walk a mile to this masjid they've built and it was 40 degrees 100 percent humidity and I overheated on the way back I overheated so badly I had to sit in the air-conditioned van for 20 minutes they were actually we went to another project they were there ready to lay the found first foundation stone for this other masjid all the dignitaries there, all the, all the kids there, the villagers there, they had to wait 20 minutes for me because I was f there to film it. <laughs> they had to wait for me to call, to call down. I was sat there, honestly, I like overheated. But that's the only time on any trip that I've ever had that. But you've had, uh, no doubt you've got extensive footage on all these trips that you've done. Have you not thought about compiling a documentary as well? Well, no, not really. And the reason for that is most of the stuff I filmed was all for other charities. So I went as a charity for, to film for an organization. So I would just hand them over the footage. Um, I've got a copy of most things, but again, it's like, yeah, I could do, I, I, I could do, but I, I have my most recent documentary, which is just finished editing and is about to go to the final sound mix in color grade is, is called Selab, um, which is obviously Urdu for flood. And that is about the aftermath oh, of the Selab. That's Selab. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so and it's that's aftermath. Covering the floods, floods in which region? Was 